Hi everyone, so here we are with lesson 11 from the book The Science of Being by Charles Fillmore. Um, if you've been following, you will know that this book is basically um, a series of lessons and that at the end of each lesson there's um, a set of affirmations or statements to go with it. Um, which really help to develop that spiritual faculty and to really absorb and meditate on the information that we have taken in. And information, of course, does exactly what it says in the word. It forms inside you. And by working on the inside, we're obviously helping ourselves to blossom and grow uh, in the Christ mind, which will, of course, radiate outward and by the cosmic laws um, come back also. Um, so this lesson number 11 is actually called judgment and justice. So this is a really important one and even if you've missed some of the others I would um, definitely recommend listening to this because um, it kind of explains karma in a really nice way that helps us to really have peace in our surroundings and self-assurance um, and self-esteem. Um, I feel like there's a tendency in some spiritual people to um, feel like a bit downtrodden or a bit martyrish or a bit like, oh, but I'm always doing good and nothing good ever happens to me. Um, firstly, that's a state of mind that you need to work on and alter and find the real root reason of why you feel that way. And secondly, rest assured that that is not true um, in many, many cases because actually divine law is always working itself out. Divine law is perpetual and eternal and there is a rigid cosmic law of justice and it is working all things out for your best good. Um, but you do have to be aware and awake about the choices that you're making and the statements that you're saying and the thoughts that you're holding about yourself. So, you know, find that place of self-love. And if you don't feel like you love and honor yourselves, find out what your resources are to really tap into that self-love. Uh, we can do another video about that another time. Lesson 11, Judgment and Justice. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye measure, it shall be measured unto you. Or in short, what goes around comes around. What you sow, you will reap period. The law as given by Mo Moses is for the guidance of man in the evolution of his faculties. The figures, personalities and symbols represent potentialities developed and undeveloped on various planes of consciousness. The high priest stands for spiritual man, officiating between God and sense man. The breastplate in an armour protects the most vital part, the heart. The heart is love, the affectional consciousness in man. It may be subject to the force of weak sympathy and less balanced by another power in which is discrimination or judgment. The breastplate had on it 12 precious stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. This clearly means that the 12 faculties of the mind must be massed at the great brain center called the solar plexus. It means that all the intelligence of man's faculties must be brought into play in the final judgments of his mind. The Urim and Thummim, lights and perfections, under the Egyptian symbology, truth and justice, are the oracular edicts of divine mind that are intuitively expressed as a logical sequence of the divine principles, truth and justice. A modern metaphysician would interpret all this as signifying the omnipresence of divine mind in its perfect idea, 
Christ. Truth is ready at all times to give judgment and justice. As God is love, so God is justice. These qualities are in divine mind, in unity, but are made manifest in man's consciousness too often in diversity. It is through the Christ mind in the heart that they are unified. When justice and love meet at the heart centre, there are balance, poise and righteousness. When judgment is divorced from love and works from the head alone, there goes forth the human cry for justice. In his mere human judgment, man is hard and heartless. He deals out punishment without consideration of motive or cause and justice goes awry. Good judgment, like other faculties of the mind, is de developed from principle. In its perfection, it is expressed through man's mind with all its absolute relations uncurtailed. Man has the right concept of judgment and ideally the judges of our courts have that unbiased and unprejudiced discrimination which ever exists in the absolute. A prejudiced judge is abhorred and a judge who allows himself to be moved by his sympathy is not considered safe. The metaphysician finds it necessary to place his judgment in the absolute in order to demonstrate its supreme power. This is accomplished by one's first declaring that one's judgment is spiritual and not material and that its origin is in good or God. That all its conclusions are based on truth and that they are absolutely free from prejudice, full sympathy or personal ignorance. This gives a working centre from which the ego, or I am, begins to set in order its own thought world. The habit of judging others, even in the most insignificant matters of daily life, must be discontinued. Judge not that ye be not judged, said Jesus. The law of judgment works out in a multitude of directions and if we do not observe it in the small things we shall find ourselves failing in the large. Judging from the plane of the personal leads into condemnation and condemnation is always followed by the fixing of a penalty. We see faults in others and pass judgment upon them without considering motives or circumstances. Our judgment is often biased and unprejudiced, yet we do not hesitate to think of some form of punishment to be meted out to the guilty one. He may be guilty or not guilty. Decision as to his guilt or innocence rests in the divine law, and we have no right to pass judgment. In our ignorance, we are creating thought forces that will react upon us. With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. Whatever thought you send out will come back to you. This is an unchangeable law of thought action. A man may be just in all his dealings, yet if he condemns others for their injustice, that thought action will bring him into unjust conditions. So it will not, so it is not safe to judge except in the absolute. Jesus said that he judged no man on his own account, but in the Father, that is, he judged in the principle. This is the stand which everyone must take, resting judgment of others in the absolute. When this is done, the tendency to condemn will grow less and less until man, seeing his fellow man as God sees him, will leave him to the absolute in all cases where he seems unjust. The great judgment day of scripture indicates a time of separation between the true and the false. There is no warrant for the belief that God sends man to everlasting punishment. Modern interpreters of the scripture say that the hell of fire referred to 
by Jesus simply means a state in which purification is taking place. The word hell is not translated with clearness sufficient to represent the various meanings of the word in the original language. There are three words from which hell is derived. Sheol, the unseen state, Hades, the unseen world, and Gehenna, Valley of Hinnom. These are used in various relations, nearly all of them allegorical. In the sermon of Archdeacon Farrar, it says there would be the proper teaching about hell if we calmly and deliberately erased from our English Bible the three words damnation, hell and everlasting. I say unhesitatingly, I say claiming the full, fullest right to speak with the authority of knowledge that not one of those words ought to stand any longer in our English Bible, for in our present ex acceptation of them, they are simply mistranslations. This corroborates the metaphysical interpretation of scripture and sustains the truth that hell is a figure of speech that represents a corrective state of mind. When error has reached its limit, the re retroactive law asserts itself and judgment being part of that law brings the penalty upon the transgressor. This penalty is not punishment but discipline and if the transgressor is truly repentant and obedient, he is forgiven in truth. Metaphysicians have discovered that there is a certain relation between the functions and organs of the body and the ideas in the mind. The liver seems to be connected with mental discrimination and whenever man gets very active along the line of judgment, especially where condemnation enters in, there is disturbance of some kind in that part of the organism. A habit of judging others with severity and fixing in one's mind what the punishment should be causes the liver to become torbid and to cease its natural action. The complexion becomes muddy as a result. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but are after the spirit. This statement held in mind and carried out in thought and act will heal liver complaint of that kind. Another form of thought related to judgment is the vacillating of the mind that never seems to know definitely what is the proper thing to do. A double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. There must be singleness of mind and loyalty to true ideas. Everyone should have definite ideas of what is just and right and stand by them. This stimulates the action of the liver and often gives so-called bad people good health because they are not under self-condemnation. Condemnation in any of its forms retards freedom of action in the discriminative faculty. When we hold ourselves in guilt and condemnation, the natural energies of the mind are weakened and the whole body becomes inert. The remedy for all that appears unjust is denial of condemnation of others or of self and affirmation of the great universal spirit of justice through which all unequal and unrighteous conditions are finally justified. I'll say that one more time. The remedy for all that appears unjust is denial of condemnation of others or of self and affirmation of the great universal spirit of justice through which all unequal and unrighteous conditions are finally adjusted. Observing the conditions that exist in the world, the just man would have them righted according to what he perceives to be the equitable law. Unless such a one has spiritual understanding, he is very likely to bring upon himself physical disabilities in his efforts to reform men. 
if his feelings come to a point of righteous indignation and he boils with anger over the evils of the world, he will cook the corpuscles of his blood. Jesus gave this treatment for such a mental condition. For neither doth the Father judge any man, but he hath given all judgment unto the Son, or unto the divine principle. This Son is the Christ, the universal cosmos. To its equity, man should commit the justice that he wishes to see brought into human affairs. Put all the burdens of the world upon the one supreme judge and hold every man and all the conditions in which men are involved amenable to the law of God. By doing so, you will set into action mind forces powerful and far-reaching. If you think that you are unjustly treated by your friends, your employers, your government, or those with whom you do business, simply declare the activity of the almighty mind and you will set into action mental forces that will find expression in the executors of the law. This is the most lasting reform to which man can apply himself. It is much more effective than legislation or any attempt to control unjust men by human ways. Jealousy is a form of mental bias that blinds the judgment and causes one to act without weighing the consequences. This state of mind causes the liver to act violently one day and to be torpid the next, finally resulting in a jaundiced, jaundiced eye and yellow skin. We speak of one blinded by jealousy or blinded by prejudice. We do not mean by this that the physical eyes have been put out, but that the understanding has been darkened. Whatever darkens the understanding interferes in some way with the purifying processes of the organism, and the fluids and pigments are congested, and the skin becomes darkened in consequence. The remedy for all this is a dis dismissal of that poor judgment which causes one to be jealous and a fuller trust in the great all-adjusting justice of God. In this there should be active trust which is a form of prayer. The disturbing elements that come into life should be definitely placed in the hands of God. This is much more than mere doubtful trust or negative expectancy that things will be made right. The spirit of justice should be appealed to and prayed to with the persistence of Elijah or of the Gentile woman whose importunity was rewarded. When the metaphysician sits by his patient with eyes closed, he is not asleep but very much awake to the reality and mental visibility of forces that enter into and make the conditions of the body. This spiritual activity is necessary to the demonstration of the law. By clearing your understanding and acknowledging the one supreme mind in which is all discrimination, you can cultivate the ability of your mind to arrive quickly at right conclusions. Take the stand that is your inheritance from God to judge wisely and quickly. And do not depart therefrom by statements of inefficiency in matters of judgment. When you are in doubt as to the right thing to do in attaining justice in worldly affairs, ask that the eternal spirit of justice shall go forth in your behalf and bring about and restore to you that which is your very own. I'll say that again. Ask that the eternal spirit of justice shall go forth on your behalf and bring about and restore to you that which is your very own. Do not ask for anything but your own 
but your very own under the righteous law. Some people unconsciously overreach in their desire for possessions. When they put the matter into the care of spirit and things do not turn out just as they had expected in their self-seeking way, they are disappointed and rebellious. This will not do under the spiritual law, which requires that man shall be satisfied with justice and accept the results, whatever they may be. There is a divinity that shapes our ends. It can be cooperated with by one who believes in things spiritual, and he will thereby be made prosperous and happy. So that's the end of today's lesson. Um, we will now go into the statements or affirmations for the realization of divine mind. It's going to help to connect us with spiritual um, judgment and justice by um, absorbing these words, meditating on these words, letting them really form inside you as their information unravels. Uh, so, so we'll take deep breath, two, three deep breaths and then I'll read each one and uh, leave a little gap for you to say them back to yourself quietly in your mind or to say them out loud as you prefer. So we'll inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. First deep breath. Second deep breath. And last deep breath. Teach me thy way, O God, and lead me in a plain path. The righteousness of the divine law is active in all my affairs and I am protected. Stand therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The meek will he guide in justice. I will sing of loving kindness and justice. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. Judge not that ye be not judged. Behold now, I have set my cause in order. I know that I am righteous. I believe in the divine law of justice and I trust it to set right every transaction in my life. We'll read that one again. I believe in the divine law of justice and I trust it to set right every transaction in my life. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And this last one is very important. I no longer condemn, criticize, censor 
or find fault with my associates, neither do I belittle or condemn myself. I no longer condemn, criticise, censor or find fault with my associates, neither do I belittle or condemn myself. And that was the last one for today. Um, so I just think those statements really do highlight the fact that self-love and forgiveness and understanding and processing um, our sticky points um, is so important, really, really important. Um, and trusting in the divine law of justice, working itself out in the unified field is huge. Um, and we don't need to bother. We don't need to get our hands dirty. We don't need to muddy our souls. We don't need to worry ourselves or shorten our lives over other people's karma. Uh, you know, we are each um, a core emanating outward and receiving back what we put out. So if somebody else is really bothering you, you can actually be assured also that sounds a bit judgmental, but that what they're putting out, it's going to be their cycle. It's going to be what they reap. So you do, really don't need to worry about um, taking matters into your own hands at all. Uh, because God is good and God is all. Um, and everything will be worked out in the end. Or perpetually working itself out anyway um, so we just we do best to work on ourselves and to shape our realities from the inside out and that's how we will come to Eden for ourselves um, but unfortunately loving and honoring and forgiving others is part of our journey to get there so, um, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but, you know, challengingly, that is part of the process. Anyway, um, I will say goodbye now. So I pray that divine love manifests itself in you always and in all ways. Peace and light. <laughs>